Hello students, welcome to EPG Patashala. I am Dr. K. R. Ramamohan, Associate Professor, Head Department of Anthropology, Sikkim University. Today, we are going to discuss a module on Thinkers on Indian Civilization, Sri Aurobindo. This module comes under the paper Indian Anthropology. Before we go this module, let us see what are the learning objectives. From this module, you know about this Sri Aurobindo's view on Renaissance of Hinduism and British rule. We also know about the Sri Aurobindo's concept of passive resistance and nationalism. To begin with, Sri Aurobindo's concept on Hindu Renaissance and patriotism, nationalism. Let us understand briefly about his some of the details of his early childhood. Sri Aurobindo was born on August 15, 1872. Many Aurobindo's followers feel that Indian independence has come on Aurobindo's birthday. Anyway, Aurobindo was educated in England. So after his taking his education mostly in England, mostly the anglicized way and habits, ideas and ideals. It is said that Sri Aurobindo spoke English and Hindu Isani only and learned mother tongue only after when he came from England. Aurobindo is famous for his philosophy, integral yoga, and say, which is most popularized in Pondicherry. Sri Aurobindo had the advantage of both an occidental and an oriental forms of education, where he could put his efforts and synthesized into one form and could integrate most of his things in his philosophy. So both Sri Aurobindo's synthesis of yoga and Sri Aurobindo's integral philosophy are the applications we call the Vijnana Yada in Sanskrit and it is also stands in contrast with the analytical and dialectical approaches of which dominate the western ideological thinking. In 19th century when India is under the British rule because due to the spread of modern education and growing public activities there was an instance developed a social awakening among all Indians. Along with the social and political ideas, we can see the rise of Hinduism and Indian nationalism among Indians during the British rule. So, this new Hinduism became the tool for national consciousness in India. Earlier, this national consciousness was not there. Perhaps for the first time, Indians wanted to unite and fight against the British and a new forms of consciousness has arisen. But this consciousness was broad enough to include Muslims, Parsi, Christian and other religious minorities in India. So, in the beginning of 20th century, nationalism became more aggressive and more anti-colonial. So, in this scenario, when India is grappling with the issues of nationalism and India is grappling with the issues of multi-religious tolerance, Sri Aurobindo Ghosh was instrumental in giving a radical approach to the idea of nationalism in India. So let us understand Sri Aurobindo's 
concepts on renaissance of Hinduism. Because Hinduism is an ancient religion which is coming from through historical processes. Sri Aurobindo carried forward the concept of development of Neo Vedanta in a sense that Vedanta, which has come from the classical Hinduism, which has been understood in its spirit, understood in its historical content, Sri Aurobindo wants to put a new framework, new light. And declared that that the true message of Vedanta, which has come from an historical process of Indian civilization, was basically and quintessentially is the propagation of selflessness, selfless action, or the practice of karma yoga. So in the theory of karma yoga, which is propounded by Sri Aurobindo, an individual was enjoined to perform his duties without aspiring for the fruits thereof. To put it simply, Meaning that one has to perform the duty without bothering for the results. The result will be good, but we should not worry for the outcome. So that is the guiding principle of the Karma Yoga. The same principle we can also find in the principles of Gita has informed us to fight against injustice because an individual's life is surrounded by number of various struggles one has to confront with in one's lifetime. So taking the lines of Gita, Sri Aurobindo was the opinion that there was a need for a renaissance of Hinduism, which he called for the awakening of the Indian soul at a collective level, which was deep in slumber. It is in the dormant stage. One has to awaken this spirit of Indian soul, which comprised of or guided by intellect. So this could achieve its glory only through the philosophy of Vedanta, which has been enshrined in the ancient philosophical writings, which are very much important. The concepts of spirituality, but we don't find these things in modern science. So taking the parallels to the Western counterpart, where he opined that the West was glorified the technological advancements through science. But the advancement of science could give only technology and but not give the whole edifice of this world, which could not illuminate the world. So hence the spirit of every human heart had to be awakened to revive the glory of Hinduism. So in this sense, Hinduism should change the rags of the past so that its beauty must be restored and it can be understood in its entirety. So it must alter its bodily appearance so that one can see the true soul and the beauty of Hinduism. 
So according to Sri Aurobindo, the new goal of new Hinduism was to pay the way for emergence of Indian nationalism and to harmonize the word and the spirit, that means the action. So Sri Aurobindo believed that the most important thing of Hinduism was to propagate just pure action in both thought and aspiration which can only be realized in one's actions. Sri Aurobindo was, though he was working under the British government, but he was critical of the entire British rule. Most of the things Sri Aurobindo did not agree with the opinion that that this divide and rule policy. He said that it was a curse on the majority of the Indian population because foreign rule in Indian soil has snapped the entire moral and the psychological energies of the people of India. He was very critical about this stance. And Sri Aurobindo opined that the British rule has ruined the economy of India, which was very good. And it did not allow the Indian population to develop as an independent nation. The British rule has disorganized the Indians into a mere crowd, a collection of people with no center of strength or means of resistance. It did not give any scope for these people. It failed to recognize the human capabilities. And Sri Aurobindo has opined that the British government in India had the worst type of bureaucratic disposition which could divide into many pieces. And India held in subjugation for long years. Though British claim that they give good government, but Sri Aurobindo said that it is the false statements and this government was not efficient. And the substitute for this is Sri Aurobindo proposed the self-government and individual freedom. Sri Aurobindo has a specific ideas about nationalism. What makes this nationalist spirit among Indians during the British rule? After the partition of Bengal, there was a tremendous upheaval in the country and a large number of people have joined the Swadeshi movement led by the radical group of the Congress party. And at that time, Sri Aurobindo has also joined this movement. But he was a philosopher of a new party. He said that the concepts of Swaraj and Swadeshi and national education and boycott this new ways of resistance. For Sri Aurobindo, Swaraj meant the complete independence because Sri Aurobindo argued that a political agitation was launched to secure few seats in bureaucracy and in assembly but not to secure the right of self-government to the people. Hence, the concept Swadeshi meant that using the product that manufactured in our country only as a national education stood for imparting education to Indians that suited their temperament, needs and culture. 
In Sri Aurobindo's concept, boycott means not to use the products manufactured from the West, particularly from England. So the methods proposed by Sri Aurobindo were necessary to train the people in national spirit, which is required at that point of time. And it becomes the architects of individual liberty and collective freedom. Thus for Sri Aurobindo, the new politics stood for individual self-development and mutual self-help. Sri Aurobindo hoped that it would deeply inculcate the true spirit of nationalism among Indians. Hence, Sri Aurobindo's concept of nationalism was based on Vedanta philosophy, which saw inherently the unity and the oneness both in man and God. So there was an essential unity in Indian society. Despite there is an existence of outward differences, due could be due to caste, due could be religion, it could be religion, language, all these things. With this spirit of unity and oneness, Sri Aurobindo thought it has pervaded all the Indian society. To become India rejuvenated, to become India a new Shakti, to gain a new momentum of energy or to attain a new sense of power, Sri Aurobindo thought this must be physical, moral, material and spiritual attributes. Only then India can attain this new sense of spirit and energy. Only the power or the strength of nation can be dependent when the unity is there in the entire country. Sri Aurobindo was critical of those who claimed that due to cultural and racial and linguistic diversity and many divisions in Indian society, India could never become in a true sense, a complete nation or a complete country. But Sri Aurobindo pointed out that if we carefully studied the history of Europe and England of the last two centuries, one would realize that there were conditions was very different from India. But England and many other countries in Europe have emerged as nations despite there were some differences among even in these countries. So in the same lines, India would also can succeed and to become an independent, a coherent, a unified nation because this has happened in the entire course of history. So history tells us, history informs us, there is a law operating even though there were differences, people segregated, but they can be united for one common end. So, Sri Aurobindo had thought that this can be achieved, a nation can be achieved, a nation can get powerful, a nation can bring energy, but without political freedom. If there is no political freedom, a nation cannot rejuvenate on its own self and the nation cannot become advanced and it is not possible. So Sri Aurobindo was the opinion that education played a key role in the development of a total inclusive <coughs> national consciousness among all the people of India. Sri Aurobindo recognized the importance of villages in the Indian life and pointed out that 
unlike in the western countries where the city was the center of political action Sri Aurobindo opined Indian villages can become the backbone of national persistence According to Sri Aurobindo Indian villages were largely democratic their autonomous units on its own their self governing therefore to make regenerate of the village was important if you want to regenerate the whole india so sri arabindo said that village should retain its autonomy and self government but at the same time one should seek in to promote national cohesion hence sri arabindo held that the days of independent village had gone and must not be revived national unity could only be achieved when the rural population was developed into a mighty a single and compact democratic nationality so the ideal of national swaraj must be modeled out of this old village communities which were self sufficient which were autonomous and basically self governing so sri arabindo's concept of nationalism was based on the age old vedanta philosophy which stood for the unity between man and god so sri arabindo used hindu religious ideals and symbols to explain and realize it that the ideal of indian nationalism was largely hindu in character but pointed out that this nationalism was wide enough to include muslims and other communities their cultures and traditions so according to sri arabindo the hindu should win swaraj for himself as well as for the muslim on the other hand a large part of the theory of nationalism was based on the awakening of the dominant spirit of nationalism that has latent in the soul of india which is there dormant for long time when we need to tap it out we need to make him it up so the struggle against the foreign rule would enable to achieve this self realization in one of the ideas about this whole nationalism banerji discussed about the orientalism and today it is considered to be as over simplification so the whole process of colonization in what history has given successfully to the age of nationalism now the global age and in all these one can see the legacy of post enlightenment europe continues to unfold in many ways and these four acted independently in a braided fashion they are intertwined sometimes as an amalgam so all these can be thought as emerging from the european enlightenment so one can come to the means of enlightenment positivism positivist racism or we can say ethnocentrism the romantic orientalism and the dialogic orientalism so positivism in the enlightenment does not make any distinction between human beings the colonizers and the colonized so in that sense one must understand how this european understanding of positivism which they constitute in the field of orientalism so the first of these could be called romantic orientalism because acknowledging the enlightened west where defined by the materialists and the projects of other the orient has this become colonized so this fascination of this other as romantic exotic primitive has to be come out of its shackles of orientalism so taking further this discourse on nationalism and orientalism the romantic orientalism it may be as a dialogic orientalism which has constituted the awareness among the west and the other within our own culture 
so which has been suppressed and neglected for a long period of time and it has become the logocentric discourse of enlightenment so this anthropological deformation needs to be corrected so engagement in dialogue with the living potential of that in non western cultures can be transformed and enrich this world thus one can create a new future another important contribution by sri arbindo he proposes the theory of passive resistance sri arbindo thought that the method of passive resistance which was used by the irish nationalists could be a learning lessons for india and which will be a, a, an ideal model for india hence sri arbindo developed the theory of passive resistance in a series of articles published in in his weekly called bande matra so passive resistance meant that the resistance to the authority of the government in an organized manner and through peaceful means so the use of arms was not allowed in passive resistance it was peaceful so according to sri arbindo the attainment of political freedom was the goal of passive resistance it is the end and the means are just passive resistance so freedom in india was necessary to stop the drain of wealth and to carry out the social reforms not that all the wealth should go out of india to the uk and we need more social reforms so the program of swadeshi national education the boycott and the establishment of arbitration courts was the program only to meant for self development but this program on its own would not be in a position to secure political freedom for india so political freedom could only be secured by consolidating by organizing these passive resistance carried on a larger scale so the policy was followed by parnell in in ireland so we have to take that model from ireland to india that was sri arbindo's idea of passive resistance that we should withdraw the support of cooperation to the government and the various approaches of this passive resistance according to sri arbindo works on two levels at first level he encouraged the people to pursue the methods of self development that is according to the swadeshi movement and the national education concept and it has to be taken this success because refusal to assist the program refusal to pay taxes to the governments boycotting the products and manufactured in foreign countries boycotting the government schools and colleges and law and other institutions established by the british on counter attackingly starting our own schools our own colleges our own arbitration mechanisms to dispute our own cases and train the people in a method to self help themselves so that national independence can be achieved in the near future so let us summarize sri arbindo's concept of nationalism sri arbindo's concept of passive resistance and the arbindo's concept of integral yoga sri arbindo's political ideas could be divided into two phases in the first phase sri arbindo expounded the concept of indian nationalism and developed the theory of passive resistance in the second phase a great future for india is theory of passive resistance where he wrote extensively on the ideal of human unity and the essential characteristics of 
Indian model of state building, not to follow the Western models. Thus, in the first phase, he was militantly eager to liberate his motherhood from the bondages. And in the second stage, he was a great sage, a philosopher who sought into give message to the people the ideals of human unity, nationalism to achieve these goals. Sri Aurobindo's concept of nationalism was based on the classical Vedanta philosophy, which saw unity and concerns both in man and God. So there was an essential unity in India despite the existence of many social, cultural and physical differences. Because the guiding principle of Indian society is unity which has been enshrined in the perils of Vedanta philosophy. That spirit which unites these people. And Sri Aurobindo proposed his theory of passive resistance which he cited the example of Irish people that they could gain independence through non-cooperation, passively resisting the colonizer. In that sense, Sri Aurobindo thought that we could learn a lesson from the other countries and bring this model here and to suit according to our own needs and could be considered as a precursor to the Gandhian theory of Satyagraha. So Aurobindo was of the opinion that while the development of passive resistance movement, the aspirations of the people would grow and they would acquire the imminent capacity to actualize a nation and a national self-consciousness with a national will in their everyday activities.